Welcome to this section of the system settings. We will show you what settings we recommend to change and or what the impact is of settings of other settings. It's up to you to choose what fits your situation best. Based on our experience, we will show you our recommended settings and tell you why we choose those settings. First of all, where can you find these ones? Under admin and application wide shared features and there's the system settings. Basically, this is one of the first things that we need to enable for auto test to work properly. Uh, it will work even if you don't change anything. There's a couple of defaults already set, but it's good that you kind of go through it and understand what these settings control. The first section is contracts. I will expand it by clicking on the plus sign. And the first one is apply the contract role block hour multiplier to block our overages. Again, uh, if you have this one uh, uh, enabled or if this one is, is uh, applicable in your business, then you can turn it off, on. Right now we have left it off because we don't use a contract role block hour multiplier. Um, we have usually the rates set up in the, in the contracts. That one will be uh, shown in a different video. Automatically execute billing rule instances. Uh, we always put that one to on because yes, you do want to have a much of automating. So when, whenever you can use automating, you use it. And there's also, uh, that's going to be further explained in the billing rules where we can uh, enable a little bit more. Billable amount round to four decimal places instead of two decimal places when labor items are approved. I would say turn the one off. Uh, you just want to have the two decimals. We don't need the four decimal places. The only thing is there are some accounting systems that when you connect it to Autodesk, they do want to have those four decimal places. So then you might be, uh, be needing to go back. Uh, but in general, uh, two decimals is perfectly fine. It's the same thing too with the billable hours. Uh, you just want to have the two decimals and the, the third one also around the four decimal places instead of two. Uh, you just want to keep it with the two decimal places. It's perfectly fine. Decrement from inventory when transferring invoices containing uh, charges to QuickBooks. Yes, of course you want to leave that on. This is for your inventory feature. It's not a necessity to turn that feature on or to use the inventory, but indeed when you do it and when you use items, of course you want to have them transferred from your inventory. The next invoice number, uh, that's separate 1000. Here's a little button, click here to edit. It brings up a separate pop-up uh, number. And you can change to whatever number you, are, you want. You can't uh, put any, any letters in there. Some people tend to put the year there in front. So in this case, we maybe we say it's 2021. And uh, then we start with, uh, let's say, a, a bigger number. We say with uh, two, two, three, three, five, for example, like that. But then, of course, you have to uh, remember that uh, next year you need to manually change it to 2022. So just sometimes just regular number and that will keep up numbering is fine. Of course, there's a little message that there is a discontinuity in the invoice numbers. Uh, so you need to make sure that, uh, that you're going to make that change. From users for posted date in approve and post, I would say at least leave that one on. That's something not truly for contracts, it's more for approve and post for the billing and the stuff. But in this case, sometimes you want to post something in a different month than uh, the month that you're currently working on. So yeah, definitely you want to have the, the, that uh, approve and post date in there. QuickBooks transmission method, that would be only for, uh, for, for people who use QuickBooks, uh, but put basically for any, uh, any accounting system. I think by now we can say that the, the, the default setting is email. The text number, uh, here you have to put in whatever text number you, uh, you use, and then you can enter it here. For security purposes, I'm not listing anything here right now. Uh, use parent account tax reason when invoicing subsidiary items on a parent account invoice. Yeah, you need to leave that on because uh, when you invoice the parent, you need to obey by the rules of the taxation of that particular parent. And the last one, use default service desk contract for all client portal tickets. Also leave the one on. So that way you make sure that uh, any ticket that is being created there, uh, if no rules being applied, at least the default service desk contract has been applied. The CRM module. Allow account managers and account team man members to access company detail and the financials. Again, this is something that you have to uh, think about. We have uh, turned it to off. Uh, unless you say, you know, I have only one account manager, he needs to know everything, then you can turn it on uh, or you could grant them on a different level uh, uh, access to this one. But by default, they don't need the financials. Enable editable opportunity grid. Yes, for sure, turn the one on because once you have the grid with all the opportunities, you can easily edit uh, some of the fields like an Excel sheet. 
if you don't have this one on, you need to uh, open up every opportunity and that's a little bit more work. Material code to use when converting quoted shipped items to billing items. Uh, that's usually shipping, but uh, in another video, we showed you a couple of other material codes and maybe you can even do uh, the shipping items. Maybe you have it under a different one, but in this case, we have a separate code that says shipping. So that's the one that you choose. Next code number. Also here you have that, that option of what uh, what's going to number be. Right now it's just one. We can again put that same range of the 2021 and we put a different different sequence in there. It looks like we created a lot of a lot of numbers, a lot of quotes. Require an opportunity loss reason. Uh, it says do not require. I would say uh, yes. Oh, it doesn't require uh, <laughs> the number. Does probably does not like the dashes. So right now we're just going to put in a number. Here we say, okay, we got reason only, and we're going to do that for the win reason too. And by doing so, at least you have a default setting of a reason, it gives you the ability to track it a little bit. Um, there's also an option to have a, a separate box that says reason detail. And reason detail is when everybody can um, put their own comments in there, like kind of a little bit verbiage. If you do that, then of course you have a lot more detailed information, but it, it is a lot of time that you need to put. So I would say require reason only. When a to-do is deleted, set its action type to. Should not have really uh, uh, a to-do deleted. Uh, and once that is deleted, set its action type to. It's probably just then a, a, a general uh, one. Don't forget, by the way, when you're done or when you're halfway done or you have to leave, press the save button in the interim. So that way you know for sure that nothing has been uh, set. In this case, because I sit a little bit changing on the on the QuickBook transmission method, we have already a pop up here. And in this case, I'm going to apply a setting that I want to apply for everything going forward because I'm changing it everything. So in this case, we'll say OK. And then again, also another uh, comment here on top is that for some settings, you need to take uh, table effect only when you log out and re log in. Let's continue with expense reports. And there's a display work type field on new edit expense screen. This one can be left off because you don't need a work type field when you do an expense. So that's a good setting. Inventory, again, only if you use this particular uh, module. Um, default description to use for purchase order items. You use your product catalog. Uh, sometimes you can use, indeed, you can use the, the code item. Uh, that would be a good one too to change that one if there's a, a, a change. So in this case, yeah, I would say let's use a code item. It's maybe a little bit better. Enable disable inventory notifications. And that means uh, you have it now in this case, you have it all uh, set. There's a little uh, pop up menu. Click here to edit. And this is where you can enable what you want to have done. Uh, when you start with the inventory module to work with, I would say leave everything on. Then you get all the notifications and you can see better how the system is uh, is performing. Next purchase order number also is a, is a number that you can choose. Right now it's a two. We can choose that one in the, in the three series and we put 30 30. Purchasing team is a little pop-up menu where you can select the resources that are part of your purchasing team. Make sure you have the right people uh, listed here. Right now there's no resources in this solution, but you could uh, check which resources should be the person that's responsible for the purchasing. Uh, this is a very nice feature, require approval before ordering. A lot of times it's a $5,000 is, is usually the, the, the kind of the good value because this one is in dollar setup. Require users to enter reason when manually updating an inventory item on hand quality. Uh, it says never prompt. I would say uh, prompts are basically always required. Several features, but I would say whenever you do a manual change, uh, put in a note why you did that. Uh, it's your initial inventory. Uh, you found a couple of items that were uh, came back from somebody that was not accounted for, or there's a couple of items that you found damaged, so you could put a little note in there. Later on, when you want to track the changes in your inventory, you have those notes, uh, it comes in very handy. So always require. When quoting or creating charges for inventory items, you use the following unit cost. In this case, you can use average cost. It depends all on how you want to do the, the, the whole accounting in the, in the system. Uh, a lot of people, they say it's uh, first in, first out, meaning the cost of a unit received first in the past is being done first. So I'll just go with that one for now, but it's not a, a big item where you use the inventory to do cost calculation as well. But now it's set up correctly. 
The Microsoft Outlook extension is the integration by outcome as an account opportunity owner. Again, you turn it one off like the same thing in the, in the other one. Now, a lot of people, we don't use the MS Outlook extension anymore, so you can kind of ignore the one. Projects allow time entry on completed tasks. By default, it says prohibit add and edit. Um, I would say allow. What we have seen a lot of times, a task has already been completed, but the project is not completed. And we find out that uh, because the project is not completed, that we had to do some more work on, on, a, on a completed task within the project. So I would definitely say allow. Check resource availability when saving project tasks. It's again, if you use the project module uh, very intense, uh, then this one is a nice feature to have. Uh, right now, you can leave it off. Uh, if you start using projects and you want to use that resource availability, then you can uh, turn it on. But if you would do it, and of course, it's going to take a little bit more to save the project because it has to calculate the, the availability. When searching by task, use the main Autodesk search, which is this one over here. Limit search to tasks created within this many months. It sets to 12. I think it's perfectly fine. You can upgrade it to 24. Depends again, how big is your database? If you just barely started, 12 is perfectly fine. Once you go bigger, you might want to choose it to 24. Uh, don't put it too big because then uh, when you press for a search, it will take forever to go through your entire database. Service desk. So here's the opposite. Allow time entry on completed tickets. It's something that you have to choose. I would kind of say when a ticket is completed, I would say prohibit add and edit. Uh, that would be the section. Uh, I would say prohibit add. You can't add anything, but you're allowed to edit if somebody makes a typo or those kind of things. But technically, a completed ticket should not be allowed to have a time entry. Again, this depends on your situation. If you see that, uh, for example, in the beginning, you will find out that probably a lot of tickets have been completed and your resources forgot to put the entry. So once you start with Autotask, I suggest you start with doing it to allow. That will give you a little bit more flexibility, but make sure further down the road, you tighten down more those controls. For now, the best way is to say prohibit add and allow edit. But once you start off and you have some problems with completed tickets with no entries, then uh, enable this feature. Allow users that can view all tickets. Remember, this is the user that views all the tickets to create, edit, and delete appointments for other resources. So yeah, that user that has the, that ability let them also have that ability to delete appointments. Usually it's the, your, your service coordinator, your project coordinator, or your dispatcher, or how you have labeled that, that position. It's the same thing too with the second one too, is for the dispatch calendar, that particular person should have access to. So that's a good one to check it out. Allow users that cannot view all tickets to create, edit, and delete ticket charges. That's a little uh, duplicate here because a user that cannot view all tickets means that only can do their own uh, own tickets. Uh, does not need to create, edit, or delete the ticket charges, but you want to have an add. Now, in this case, it's not add a ticket charge, so it's just uh, adding those ticket charges. So yes, it's correct. Leave it unchecked. Automatically assign ticket tags to tickets created through the client portal. Uh, yeah, I think we can turn it on. Once you use the, the, the tags, we leave the one on. Same thing too with, uh, with the incoming email processing. If you have the tags set up, uh, then this one is already applied. Uh, if you don't have tags, uh, it's fine. Automatically complete service call when completing the last non-complete task. I would turn the one off too. It's a nice feature. What we've seen in the in the in the real life, um, a technician completes a ticket, forgets to complete a service call, and down the road you will see a whole bunch of uncompleted service calls. If you have this one, then at least those service calls that the work has been done because the ticket was completed, the time entry was done, and that cleans up the the service calls. Duplicate ticket handling, for sure you want to leave the one uh, enabled. There's a, a little section uh, with some more detailed information where you can change some, some uh, detail settings. Look how much detail you have over here. Uh, duplicate ticket definition. So any ticket with the same ticket number as an existing ticket, but you can also say with the same alert ID or an external ticket, uh, or you say it's, it's more uh, detailed about any ticket and the same configuration item. And you can pick whatever you find is for you a duplicate ticket. Maybe you can just turn them all on. Now you can also say like, okay, well, what is a duplicate ticket? Well, only if it was for two days, for example. I think that a normal or a nice feature is a two days. So you have a recurring alarm and for two days it can be on the same ticket, but after that it should be a new ticket. Um, and then you can put this minutes, you can put it zero. What would be the action when it finds a duplicate ticket? Then you can say if the existing ticket has a status of complete, 
then you can change it to the status to new. That new would be then you can pick it up. There's also maybe another one that you can say uh, whatever you have, that's something that, that's uh, triggering you. For example, this one, customer note added, is usually uh, a trigger that the client responds back in, customer note added, and then you can put a workflow rule that, that notifies you. And in this case, uh, that would be the best setting to go, and then you know that the, the, the ticket has been opened, and otherwise it's going to be a new ticket. Uh, there's a couple of other settings that you can also uh, change, or you can even say, you know, I ignore the duplicate ticket, take no action. And we press save and close, very important to do that. Make sure that that's being handled. Mileage kilometers defaults uh, has been set to uh, disabled. Here we can click to edit again, a little pop-up menu uh, comes up. And we can see what are the defaults. And here we can basically see, use the round trip as a default. I think in this case it's okay. We don't have to uh, to put a mileage default. Let the person uh, enter their own default in or their own mileage in there. Uh, especially uh, this one is better if a person travels from client A to client B to client C because the, then the defaults won't apply. The system will then constantly calculate from your company to A, from your company to B, from your company to client C. So then uh, those kind of tours, what we call, they don't work. So leave it as disabled. Move merge tickets to the following queue. Making sure that you have, of course, a queue in there, merge tickets. In this case, you can uh, see it, uh, but you can also uh, uh, choose it to leave it blank. And that, uh, in that case, it will leave in the existing queue. It says also here. Second, the next two are for recalculating the SLA targets. It says right now to do not recalculate, it's a new feature. Uh, put them both to any time that something has been changed uh, to recalculate. Here you only have the any time something has been changed, so that one for sure. And this one is anytime a priority changes, uh, leave it on. Uh, sometimes people say when priority escalates, uh, yeah, when it goes up, it, for sure you want to have a, a, a tighter es uh, escalation. Only when it de-escalates, then you can recalculate. I would say anytime the priority changes, have it recalculate. Very handy, this new feature. Require a user to enter summary notes when entering ticket time. Uh, set to enabled, yes, because you have your time entry. Usually the time entry is, uh, is very... Uh, client facing it's it could be very limited you want to have them to be obligated to enter the summary notes and the summary notes contains all the detailed information programs that they used uh, other items that they uh, that they found but again they don't have to be very specific on on grammar in this, in this case because that's not the summary notes are not popping up on the on the invoice and then uh, searching by ticket is uh, again, like in the project test 24, we can put it to 12, that would be fine. Again, uh, in the beginning, you can have much more. Site setup is allow access to protect the data via the data warehouse, uh, leave the one off, you don't wanna have it there. Allow HTML widget on share dashboard tabs. Uh, later on, when you use those dashboard tabs and you wanna have uh, sensitive HTML tabs, and you can turn it on. There's a learn more button where you can even find a little bit more details, but for now it's, it's good to leave it off. Allow password variable and live links, uh, not allowed. Again, we have another one where we uh, post more stuff about live links. Enable daily alerts, yes. Enable in-out functionality, yes, because that's where you can see that if a resource has been logged in, other people can see if that particular user is available. Enable Microsoft Teams, the message is deep link. Right now it says do not display, but here those two or a very nice feature to enable the, the Teams integration. Uh, there's uh, more features that you can enable. Uh, you can maybe start off with just for your resources only. And once that is all set up, then later on you can even go with your contacts as well. Inactive live report schedule notification. Uh, that's a good one to have. Right now the administrator has, uh, has that set up. Leave it uh, for sure that one person in your organization sees that when a schedule basically is not working anymore. When you have those live reports, it's a different section. There's going to be a lot of reports that uh, that might be running out of the schedule, so you definitely want to know when it happens. Include images from Rix text fields. Yes, for sure, enabled. Lock user accounts after unsuccessful attempts. We go with the default three. Mapping provider, Google Maps. We think it's the best one, but if you let better like MapQuest or Microsoft, there's your option to choose it. Password requirements, here we have it again. Do not require strong passwords. Well, we said it in another video about security levels. I definitely have this one to, uh, to a strong setting. So I'm gonna enable it here. Require strong passwords. 
And also you can even say when you don't have the SSA or uh, two-factor authentication set up, also require users to change the password ever so many days. In this case, we're not going to do this for this particular video, but I would say uh, enable this one as well. Security event notification policy. So whenever something changes, you want to make sure that the, that the administrator gets notification. In this case, you might uh, remove the Autodesk feature here as well, because the Autodesk is a default user in the system. Uh, surveys, uh, how many do you want to have a list? The last 365 days is perfectly fine, but you can indeed uh, trim it down to the last 90 days. And surveys, limit the service to one every hour contact per day. Sometimes people will open several tickets a day, they get on several surveys. You can indeed say, I want to have a survey for every, uh, every ticket, but there's ways to control it by the hour or even by the day. So the person only maybe gets, let's say, uh, uh, they put it to seven days. The person will only get one survey per week and doesn't get annoyed with the survey, sometimes even also the follow-ups. Last section, the timesheets. Again, if you use the timesheets within the system, allow users to create time entries that cross midnight. For sure, leave the one enabled because it does happen. We don't want anybody to work during midnight, but we know in reality it does happen. Allow users to enter project test time at any role they have assigned to them in any department. As long as uh, it, it has been assigned to them, then you would say enabled. That means that uh, sometimes a high level engineer does maybe some endpoint work uh, to get the project moving. Yeah, definitely you don't wanna uh, charge the project for that high end rate. In that case, the engineer does some work for that endpoint rate. So yeah, uh, make, uh, make them have the ability to change their role for whatever is in their uh, scope. The day of the week that begins, uh, in this case Monday, but I saw some companies use it with the Sunday. So here you have the ability to, uh, to edit it, click here to edit. Display all service desk time entries on timesheet. Yes, you want to have that enabled. Do not round hours work for task or ticket time entry. That's correct. You don't you round off for your billing, but you don't round off for your timesheets. Enable conversation time time. In this case, it's turned off. You don't want to leave that one. Enable personal time. Yes. Enable sick time. Yes. Enable vacation time. Yes. Number of hours in a normal workday. It's set to eight. Number of hours in a normal workday to 40. I think that's that's common, but if you want to make changes, then here's your section where you can do it. A proxy time entry, so who can uh, edit a, uh, a time entry? In this case, you would have it always for enabled for timesheet approvals and administrators, so you always have the access to, to get to it. Uh, reduce billable uh, hours goal by reduction in available hours, yes. And require user to enter summary notes when entering project time. So this is kind of the same thing to what we had with, uh, with, uh, with the service desk. So let's check mark there. Require users to enter start and stop time on project tasks. I say yes, because again, that way you need it. You have the good visibility in your time sheet to when happened something during the day. Project time, we put it to 15 minutes uh, for billing, uh, because this is an internal billing. Uh, we can also put it to five, because that's usually a, a better interval, uh, because this is the, the project time. Ticket time entries, uh, this is the one that I should change. This is the one to the nearest 30 minutes. And that's again, your billing increments. It depends on how you bill. Uh, you may, if you bill by 15 minutes, then you can put the 15. If you bill by increments of half hour, then you can put this one in. And the submission confirmation message, have you reviewed all work? Again, if you're using a different language, you can change it to your own language or a different comment. It's basically uh, everything that you want to put in there can be put in there. Well, that is all. All the settings have been set up. Remember to press save in the end and here is also a uh, notification about the next purchase order number that, of course, it will discontinue the, the sequence. And we're all set to go. And again, the same setup is that some settings you uh, will only apply when you log out. So uh, when you want to make sure that all these settings were done right, you log out and you will continue with all the other settings.